Lowe, I'm Dr. Valerie Neal, a space historian here and chair of the Space History Department. We are in the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum for a program that is sponsored by Boeing Company. We would like to welcome our online audience today, our audience on NASA television, and give a special welcome to students who are here from one of the Washington, D.C. schools, the Whittier Education Campus. Uh, we're glad to see visitors from the museum here as well today uh, also. Uh, we've gathered today to have a program on Sally Ride curating her life because the museum has just accepted a generous donation of personal possessions and papers from Sally Ride. And as you know, Sally Ride was America's first woman astronaut. Uh, she was not a girl who aspired to be an astronaut because when she was growing up, only men were astronauts. But just as she was finishing her education, she realized that NASA was recruiting women for the first time, and she thought, I can do that, uh, because she was a scientist. She was interested in physics and astrophysics, and space had a great deal of interest to her. Uh, she applied and was selected in 1978, along with five other women who were the first women selected in the United States to be astronauts. And then she was further selected to fly on the seventh space shuttle mission in 1983 as the first woman in space for the United States. Uh, she flew again the next year uh, with another first woman, Kathy Sullivan, who did the first extravehicular activity. Uh, so together they both made history, and Sally especially became an iconic object. Uh, she became um, a celebrity overnight, something she had never imagined or really prepared for, and she became a national hero, a role model for millions of young women, girls, and even adult women who now realize that whatever you aspired to be, if you worked hard, you could achieve it even achieve being an astronaut. Uh, however, Sally herself did not see herself as an icon. Uh, she saw herself as a scientist and an educator. And when she left NASA, she went back into the world of education and spent a full 25 years teaching physics at the university level and then founding Sally Ride Science. Uh, so we're here to honor the collection that we are receiving uh, because it represents many aspects of her life. Unfortunately, Sally died too young and too soon um, in, in 2012, and it has fallen to her, uh, her very best friend, her executor, um, and her partner in tennis, in writing, and in life uh, to curate her life. Uh, to be the custodian of her possessions and papers, and also her life story. And I ha we have with us today Dr. Tam O'Shaughnessy, who is that person. Uh, Dr. O'Shaughnessy is herself a scientist and an educator, and she is now the president, co-founder, and CEO of Sally Ride Science. And it's through her generosity that the museum is accepting a collection of almost 200 objects belonging to Sally Ride, and also boxes and boxes of papers, books, notebooks. Uh, we also have today Dr. Margaret Weidekamp, who is also in the Space History Department. Uh, she is responsible for about 5,000 of the 60,000 objects that are held by the museum. And Patty Williams, who is our acquisitions archivist, and she's very active in collecting the papers of people both famous and less famous. And we're going to hear from all of these women as we go through our program today. All four of us work together uh, to assemble this collection. And we've been working together for the past two years to reach this point today. I should say that during the program we will take questions from the audience, both the audience that's present here and uh, our online audience. 
And we're going to start by talking about what it means to curate a person's life. Um, how does one look at objects and figure out what stories they tell? Which are the memorable stories of that person's life? And more particularly, what choices do we make? What decisions do we make? And why, when we're assembling a collection? And even beyond that, how do all these things that are displayed in a museum come into the museum's possession? Uh, we thought this would be uh, an interesting topic for our audience to consider, and it's something we certainly have thought a lot about. Before we start talking ourselves, though, let's let Sally tell us a little bit about herself in her own words. I was sort of a, a typical um, Southern California girl growing up. I loved sports. I was outside all the time uh, on the tennis court for probably two-thirds of my waking hours. But when I was inside, um, science and math were my, my favorite subjects. Main engine start, we have main engine start, and the ignition, and liftoff, the liftoff of SCS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. It's just an unbelievable privilege that I was able to experience space flight at a time when so few people in the world have had that opportunity. I cherish that every day. Tam, since you knew Sally the best, would you like to start by talking about this process that you've gone through over the last two and a half years? Sure. Absolutely. Um, Valerie said, my name is Tam O'Shaughnessy, and I am currently the uh, co-founder and uh, CEO of Sally Ride Science, which is a science education company in San Diego. Um, and probably more importantly, I was Sally's, uh, you know, we met when we were, I was 12 and she was 13 years old playing tennis in Southern California, and we became good friends and later uh, became partners in life, and uh, our interests were so similar, uh, we also started writing children's science books together and then co-founded a company with some of our friends to try to make a difference in science and math education across our country, so we started Sally Ride Science. Um, and as Valerie said, uh, Sally died way too early. <laughs> Most people in her family, uh, you know, her grandparents and so on, lived into the 90s, and Sally was prepared to live that long and do many more fun things, but it was not to be. And when she died, I quickly realized that I wanted to um, make sure that her legacy and who she really was was preserved, you know, for future generations. Um, and so what I did is I had no idea how to go about doing this. And I ended up calling our friend, uh, Senator Barbara Mikulski, the good senator from Maryland. Uh, she's just this wonderful, feisty woman. And uh, Sally and I would call on her for advice on occasion. So I called Barbara and asked her, uh, you know, Sally has, uh, she, Sally was a great saver. You know, you could almost say she could be on one of those hoarding shows, but it was pretty borderline. But she saved everything from the time she was a very young kid, you know, tickets to Disneyland, uh, her tennis card from the Southern California Tennis Association when she was 12 years old, and so on. But it ended up being just this treasure trove of stuff that was, uh, you know, important for, uh, for me to preserve and do something important with. So Senator Mikulski recommended the Smithsonian, the national, the national Air and Space Museum, uh, as the perfect fit, and put me in touch with Valerie. And uh, Valerie and I had a, a very wonderful uh, telephone conversation that kind of gave me the, the confidence that I had found uh, the right home. And then what happened is that, um, Valerie, Margaret, and Patty 
uh, you know, we have the, the two curators and space historians that deal with the three-dimensional objects, and then the archivist. I just learned that you say archivist, not archivist, which I've been saying for my whole life. <laughs> anyway, Patty Williams, the archivist, uh, would be responsible for uh, going through all of Sally's uh, papers um, uh, you know, very cool stuff from, uh, you know, her essays on Shakespeare that she wrote at Stanford to um, uh, her notes on the Challenger accident investigation and some of her, you know, her observations of some of the other members of the investigation team and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these three came out to my home and this was less than a year after Sally had uh, passed away, so I was still uh, kind of ragged, um, and, uh, but you know, I was excited to have them come and uh, look through all of Sally's things. And I had kind of, I'd already been trying to organize our home and just kind of figure out what was what. And Sally was actually a very organized person, and she had a physics study where she kept her, uh, all of her physics books from uh, high school and through college. She would never get rid of them. Uh, she loved her, her physics books and, and her space books. Um, and that's really where she kept uh, most of her NASA, uh, you know, films and, and uh, checklists and just all of this stuff. And then we had a study together that was kind of the Sally Ride Science, our company uh, study, where we kept uh, a whole bunch of other, other stuff. So anyway, I tried to organize stuff, and then these three came, and uh, you know, th the first day that they were at, at my house, we basically sat in the living room, you know, drinking tea or something, and just talked about, you know, they were what I remember clearly is just the respect for what were my goals for uh, giving Sally's possessions to the National Air and Space Museum. And, um, and we all just sort of got along, and there was this level of trust and, um, uh, and belief that we could put together something that would be important for future generations and do it well. So I just, you know, what I was uh, concerned with is I wanted an institution that was going to be around for centuries. That's the Smithsonian for sure. And I also wanted a place where the people who work here um, care deeply about Sally, but not just, Sally was an astronaut for 10 years. That, you know, she had you know, 31 other years that she did other things. She was a physicist, she was a science writer, she started a company, and uh, she was very important across our country with space exploration and um, the two accident investigations and uh, uh, you know, she advised presidents and all of that stuff is uh, important. Anyway, I just, um, you know, these three sort of became friends for life, and I, I could not be more uh, thrilled that this is the home for uh, Sally's stuff. Basically, you know, that was her tennis racket when she was like 13 years old. So this was her telescope when she was uh, a kid. So anyway, I'm, I'm, th I'm thrilled. Well, we were thrilled too, obviously. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to turn now to Margaret, who uh, was the principal collecting curator, and I'll remind the audience that uh, we're going to have questions in just a few minutes after Margaret speaks, so uh, be thinking about what you might want to ask Tam or Margaret uh, as we go along. Uh, Margaret, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, well, I work with our, what we call our social and cultural collection, uh, social and cultural dimensions of spaceflight, which basically means our memorabilia of the actual space program. That's the biggest part of this collection. And so when I have an opportunity like this um, to be able to go into someone's home and to think about what do we want to collect, I'm really trying to think about you know, what are the objects that we want to have at the museum so that generations from now, when people want to know the story of the people who make actual spaceflight happen, 
they're going to have the right objects that tell that story. And what you're seeing on the screen is a bit of a selection of the kinds of things uh, that we were able to um, bring here um, from Sally Ride's personal effects. Um, and so I knew right off the bat that we were going to want to add to what the museum already had uh, from Sally Ride. So you'll see behind me, if you're in the room, uh, we have uh, Sally Ride's flight suit uh, that was given to the museum in the 1980s, and that's on display here in this gallery in the Moving Beyond Earth exhibit. Um, and I knew that we wanted to take that, and then we also wanted to really build into um, a whole life. Who was this woman? Um, and I actually started my career as a women's historian and later got interested in space history. So I was really aware of how pivotal Sally Ride was as an American woman and how much her story dovetailed with really important stories about the sec women in the second half of the 20th century. Um, so for instance, the fact that she played organized sports uh, as a youth and that she competed in tennis tournaments and so she and her friends were part of this and that really tells us a story about women as physically active beginning to get into organized sports um, and really she predated uh, unfortunately for her, the uh, transition that was Title IX, which uh, said legally that you had to have equal funding for men's and women's education, really, and often it's focused on the athletics, uh, which meant that she was one of the very best tennis players at Stanford and did not have a scholarship because there was no such thing as an athletic scholarship for women at the time. So being able to bring in the tennis racket um, that you see in front of you and also up on the screen began to allow us to tell some of that story. Um, and it really was an integral part of the space flight story as well, that part of Sally Ride's application, what made her stand out uh, for the folks who were the managers at NASA was that they looked at her tennis playing and thought this is someone who knows how to play a team sport, she's coachable, she's physical, <laughs> she knows how to follow direction. If you ask her to do a set of physical tasks, she is someone who is adept at that, she knows how to get along with teammates, you can talk to her and um, she'll be able to really participate in that way. Um, and so the um, importance of her tennis playing was in many ways a real bridge then to her space flight. Um, and you'll see on the screen, we have also in the archival collection, uh, found a letter from hers and your friend, uh, Billie Jean King, uh, with a note to uh, Sally in 1983 that uh, Billie Jean was not going to be able to uh, attend her launch. Um, but again, making that connection between her career as an athlete and her career as a space flyer. And Billie Jean King is the woman who broke open women's professional tennis. Yes. And much uh, the yes. same way that Sally Ride broke open uh, the astronaut yeah. corps. And demanded parity in terms of pay and uh, all kinds of really important things, both for uh, visibility in her uh, match with Bobby Briggs, but also in terms of the structure uh, for women. Um, so then the other thing that I was doing, and you try to be, um, you realize you're going into someone's home, and all of a sudden you've gone from you know having all of these things to having these curators like literally crawling into your closets <laughs> and digging under the desk and trying and saying, what's this and what's that? Um, one of the lessons that I got when I came here to the museum 11 years ago was from one of my colleagues. One of our um, directors, associate directors, is a very famous pilot. And he would tell the story that um, as a very famous pilot, anytime he went anywhere, someone would give him a plaque. Um, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, the Kiwanis Club, there would be a plaque for him whenever he spoke. Um, and as much as he really appreciated those things, he had a lot of them. And he had a um, habit, he had an du uh, army duffel bag, and he would put them in what he called his plaque sack that that was where he kept those things. Um, and the advice that he had given to some of the curators was don't collect the plaque sack, right? You're, when you're going in and you're trying to figure out what are the yeah. lasting objects that really tell a story, figure out what the sort is that the person themselves have done. What did they think was important? Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you sort those things out? So uh, one of the things that uh, our attention was drawn to was the Shapiro Award, which is here on the table in front of us. It's a Baccarat gl glass bowl um, that was engraved and given to uh, Sally Ride in 2004 in recognition of her educational endeavors and uh, the work that she had done with Sally Ride Science. And um, 
she was tremendously proud of that, which was a public service award, um, so that she had been very publicly recognized. This is a picture of uh, Sally with uh, her friends and uh, coworkers and collaborators at the awarding of the Shapiro Award. She had been very publicly recognized for her work in spaceflight, her work as the first American woman in space, her work as the author of what became known as the Ride Report, which was really a defining vision document for NASA. Um, but personally, she was also very proud of her public service and her education work, and I thought that it was important to be able to uh, bring an object into the collection that would tell that story, and that as we're looking to record a whole life, that we would have everything from the tennis racket to the Shapiro Award that would tell a little bit of a story of the arc of who this very important woman was. Thank you for that. Uh, why don't we take a, a moment to answer a couple of questions from the audience and our online guests. Uh, I think we have an online question already queued up, and hey, it's, what was the most surprising thing you learned about Sally Ride during your research? research? And I guess that could be answered by any of us. Um, why don't for we me, start? Mm -hmm. The, I said that the social and cultural collection includes our memorabilia of actual space flight. It also includes space science fiction objects, objects that tell the story of how spa uh, space has been imagined. Um, and I was particularly personally thrilled to find that Sally Ride was a Star Trek fan. <laughs> uh, because so many people who build and design and test and fly uh, spacecraft are fans of space science fiction. Uh, but it turned out that Sally Ride was um, not only personally a Star Trek fan, uh, an avid Star Trek fan, um, but that she also had uh, been brought in when Voyager, the Star Trek franchise show, was started um, in the 1990s. They invited Sally Ride. Uh, that's a show that has a woman, Catherine Janeway, played by Kate Mulgrew, as the captain of that ship. Um, and so they invited the first American woman in space, Sally Ride, to be at a premiere of that show and gave her a um, communicator pin, one of the Star Trek <laughs> emblem pins, that was actually a prop from the show, not just a, a fan piece. And so being able to make that connection tells so many rich stories um, that are really a core to what we do here at the museum. And I was very excited to find that out. And I think that, that, that badge out. was in the composite picture we showed. Yes, it is. Ago, it was uh, in the picture. Among the medals and medallions. I, I think we have a question here in the audience. Would you right. like to uh, ask your question? Keep talking. Do we know what, yeah, do we know what prompted her to become an astronaut? You know, what was your first name again? Denisha. Okay, that's a good question. Actually, you know, as Valerie sort of said, uh, salary, salary. Sally, <laughs> what planet are we on? I've been uh, called that before. <laughs> salary, okay. Uh, Sally really never had that goal in mind, but what happened to her is, uh, and it's kind of an important double lesson. It, it, uh, uh, she was prepared to take advantage of the opportunity. She was basically eating breakfast in, the, in her college cafeteria, and she saw the student newspaper, and it said that uh, NASA was looking for women astronauts and, and, and wanted them to apply, and it was the first time in history. And so Sally saw that, and then she just had this moment where it was like, you know what? I want to do that. And before that, she was thinking that she would uh, be a university professor and keep doing research and you know, live the good life on a college campus. So it was really uh, serendipity a little bit. But she was also prepared because she had uh, studied math and science and, and so on. Okay. And her good astronaut question. classmates indicated, too, that once she became an astronaut, she totally embraced it. She worked harder, she worked longer, yep. uh, she was determined to master every skill uh, that was required. But then there came a point in her life after 10 years of doing that when she realized that wasn't the only thing she wanted to do. And I think there's a lesson in that, don't you? Sure. That you don't have to stick with the same thing for your whole life. Follow your heart. Thank you. Thank Good you. question. Uh, my name is Nakama. And 
I'm from Woody, and my question is, what was her aspiration in life before she became an astronaut? What was her aspiration in life before she became an astronaut? You know what? That's a good question, too. I'm just going to jump in. Patty, yeah, but we've no, got to... Go ahead. I'm gonna, <laughs> you're going to get to me. Yeah. Um, Sally thought of herself as a physicist. Uh, she had a very important teacher in high school, Dr. Mo Martz. And uh, that teacher encouraged her interest in science and uh, told her that she should take, like, one of those... Uh, I don't know what you call it. She was, Sally was a high school student, but she took a, a college uh, class. Um, and uh, and that, that teacher helped her decide to become a physicist, even though Sally had no clue what a physicist was or what they did. Um, so um, did I answer your question? So I think she was thinking she was going to work at a university, teach, do research, and uh, that would be her, her life. I'm going to break in here to make a, a little remark, too. I forgot to mention that Dr. O'Shaughnessy has just written a biography of Sally Ride that tells a lot of stories of her youth. And one of the things I found surprising is that when she was in high school, her, her friends thought she was an underachiever. Oh. And, and someone even wrote that in her yearbook, that she was a classic underachiever. Uh, but she found herself when she was in her 20s, and that's when she really put her whole heart into it. Yep. Uh, okay, let's move on to another question. Do we have an online question? Uh, a question from the audience? Okay, we'll come back to Q&A in a minute then. Um, well, um, I'm next to talk for just a minute about what I as a curator was looking for. Uh, I'm the curator for the space shuttle and all the objects related to the astronauts who flew during the period of the space shuttle. And when I came here, we already had Sally Wright's flight suit and had had it on display for quite some time. But um, I was interested in what else we might find from her career as an astronaut and what we might find um, that from her earlier life that gave some insight into how she ended up becoming an astronaut. So two of the objects that I was particularly pleased to find were uh, this telescope, which as you can see is a child size starter kit for a telescope uh, that her parents had given her when she was quite young because she was already curious about nature. She was curious about the sky, the constellations. Uh, she just wanted to learn everything there was to learn. And so they gave her and her sister to share a telescope and also a microscope. And so we selected both of those. And her sister, who's about two years younger, remembers very clearly that they used to take the telescope out at night into the front yard and look at the stars and the planets and speculate about what might be out there. Um, so that was good to find. We also found slide rules that she had used when she was a physics major uh, in university classes. Um, the helmet I was also delighted to find because while we had a flight suit for space flight, we didn't have anything really to indicate her love of aviation. All astronauts uh, learn to fly in the T-38 jet trainer. Only the pilot astronauts get to sit in the front seat, but the scientist astronauts sit right behind them and they serve as navigators. And they learn the whole process of navigation. And they wear NASA-issued uh, flight suits for that. But apparently they can choose their own helmet. And so this was Sally's helmet. And I loved it in particular because it's color coordinated to her flight suit. <laughs> and it has her name in a flourishing script on the back just above the neck. And uh, to me this was, uh, and I may be completely off base, it may not have been in her mind at all, but to me this at least suggested that something kind of stereotypically feminine was in her character too, that she wanted to match. <laughs> and she just didn't want her name scribbled on her helmet, she wanted it to look nice, uh, look pretty. and so. Um, we collected these. I also collected some of her badges from her years at NASA, including her visitor badge from when she went to NASA uh, to interview to be an astronaut, and her astronaut badge. And then um, 
Tam took us at the end of our visit um, into one more room that had a trunk in it. And this is another instance of Sally curating her own life. In that trunk, she had put everything that was really special to her that she wanted to be sure was kept. And that's where the astronaut clothing and the helmet were. That's where the badges were. Uh, that's where some special awards and medals and medallions were. And uh, that's where a lot of worn t-shirts were. <laughs> and I, I don't mean new t-shirts still in plastic wrap. I mean t-shirts that had sweat stains. And uh, they were faded, they were wrinkled, they had been uh, laundered. Uh, but they were all linked to her flights or to the fact that she was a female astronaut. And one of them said, a woman's place is now in space. And one of them said, well, yes, I am Sally Ride's father. <laughs> and, uh, right. and one of them had uh, an enlargement of the logo for her first mission, which subtly had designed into it um, the symbols for male and female. So there were four male symbols and one female. So these were all things that she cared about and used. And so I selected a number of those. Um, and I, I think that indicated to me that we all curate our own lives to a certain extent by what we choose to keep and where we choose to keep it. And Margaret was the first to articulate that among us. Uh, but then I realized that's not uncommon. I think we all do that. And then... Well, I'm going to oh, jump okay. in and tell one bad story on you, which is that oh. the curator also <laughs> has to make very hard choices. <laughs> because one of the other things that was in that trunk is a flight suit that is very <laughs> similar, not the same, Valerie would point out, as the one that we already have on display at the museum. And Valerie very badly wanted a second flight suit. And we said, you know, when we come back to the museum, they're going to ask, they're going to say, we have a flight suit. Why do you need a second one? And we, Patty and I kind of collectively talked Valerie down from you can't have, <laughs> everything. A, you cannot have everything and you have to make some choices. Um, and we kind of kept, on our way to the airport kept thinking Valerie's going to turn the car and like go flying back <laughs> to that truck because she desperately wants a set, the next flight suit that's slightly different. Had, it did have slightly different patches, but we yep. said, you know, when we come back to the museum, they're going to ask hard questions about why did you get a second flight suit when we very clearly, you know, we have one. Yeah. Uh, you know the museum has one, so uh, so sometimes even uh, sometimes the sorting is easier, and then sometimes you're making very hard choices to leave behind things that are kept in very good hands, but that you'd love to have in the national collection, and you have to make some some hard choices. You did let me take a flight jacket, though. We, yeah. The flight jacket is a completely different garment. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, Patty, let's talk about papers, because that's a whole different universe. Yes, it is. And as we've been talking here about the artifacts, and I think when people think about museums, they immediately think, oh, of course, artifacts. But the museum has a very, very fine collection of papers dealing with aviation and space history. In fact, we have over 17,000 linear feet of papers. Um, and historically, they've always kind of dealt with the technological advances that was happening in the aviation and space field. But I've actually been the acquisition archivist now for 26 years, and I've always been very keen to collect the papers of the people behind those technological advances, because I really think that's an important part of the history. And that's especially the case when it comes to collecting papers on women and minorities because their stories on participating in these technological, mostly male-oriented fields, really touches on a lot of social and cultural aspects that make aviation and space history that much richer. And so I was absolutely delighted when Tam reached out to us and said that she had this material. And when I went out there, I was looking for, and I, and I was excited about it for two reasons. Number one, just I knew our researchers in general would be very interested in just the general space aviation material that was in it. But then to take into account uh, Sally's, Sally's uh, iconic role as the first American woman in space would be just a wonderful resource for our researchers and for our staff. And it would also help complement the artifacts that uh, Valerie and Margaret were picking out. So uh, I went out there and I was looking not only to collect material dealing with her uh, space accomplishments, but just like Valerie and Margaret, I was looking to try to put those 
space accomplishments as much as possible into the context of her entire life and her professional career. And so I was going to go out there looking for material that happened before she was selected as an astronaut. And then, of course, the period she was an astronaut. And then that large segment afterwards when she was doing, uh, she was being a scientist and a professor and an advocate for STEM education. And so I ended up taking 24 uh, linear feet of material. Basically, I took everything Tam would let me take That's from the true. house. <laughs> and I have to say <laughs> that you said Sally was a hoarder. I've been doing this for 26 years. Right. I have been in hoarder houses. <laughs> Your house was great. Okay. And Sally was very organized. Again, she very much curated her material. Yep. Almost everything I ran across, okay. I said, wow, that really puts this aspect of her career in, um, in, in a sharp contrast to, to other parts. So I thought it was all very useful. And what I'd like to do with my segment is I'd like to show you some examples of um, some of the material that I selected. And I'd like to start with uh, material that I think most people would say, oh, of course you collected this material because it's dealing with her astronaut career. And so what was just on the screen was the um, checklist uh, for the Canadian arm uh, that she did on her first flight, um, STS-7. And if we go to the next slide, we can see these uh, were, this is an example of one of the training manuals she had. We collected about two linear feet of material just dealing with her astronaut training and her manuals. You can see on the sketch here, uh, the Canadian arm coming out the top. Uh, that was one of Sally's tasks that she was to do. Uh, she was the first woman to do it in space and that helped her retrieve a satellite. And you can see also what I love about her training materials is that she has marked up, she's highlighted just like you would for any class that you were in, trying to make sure you pass the exam, uh, highlighted things and she also annotated things along the way. So that'll be really useful for our researchers who are interested in understanding the training that the space shuttle astronauts were going through. Uh, and I'd like to segue from there into a couple of things, um, talking about Sally's um, iconic role as being the first uh, American in space. It was first American woman in space. It was a really big deal on both kind of the public um, arena and also on a private level. So if we can go to the cartoon. Here's a cartoon <laughs> from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And this is really kind of touching on, and this was something that uh, Sally evidently had carefully cut out and saved talking about the stereotypes that stereotyping she had to um, deal with becoming the first woman a, um, astronaut in, in space. And uh, I just think it's very indicative on the kind of things that were happening on the public area on a larger scale. But if we go to the, and show something on a more intimate scale, this is a letter that she got from somebody she didn't know, uh, Linda Halpern. And Linda contacted uh, Sally and sent her a copy of this letter that is being shown on the screen. Uh, Linda, when she was a girl in 1962, sent a letter to President Kennedy asking how she could become a woman astronaut. And President Kennedy sent it over to NASA who wrote her back and said, you know, thank you very much, but women aren't astronauts because you don't have the training and you're not physically able to do it. And Linda had actually saved this all these years, sent a copy of this along with a letter to Sally saying, for me, this is such an exciting, exciting thing that you're finally breaking this barrier for all of us that were denied that opportunity. So I really love this uh, example. And there's lots of examples of this from senators okay. to famous people to people who aren't famous at all, like this woman who grew up to be a, she's a tort lawyer, uh, but it really made an impression on her. So from there, I'd like to talk about after she flew, she continued to play very important roles uh, in NASA. As Margaret talked about, uh, she did, uh, was the main author on, led the uh, ride report, which was about uh, kind of strategically where NASA should go. But she also sat on several commissions um, that were very important. This is one of her notebooks. She was on the Rogers Commission, uh, which was for the, uh, dealing with the, uh, disaster, the Challenger asked, um, accident. And she was the only astronaut that was asked to be on this. And this is from, this is the outside of her notebook. And if we can go to the next slide, 
we can show these are actually the notes that she wrote as she was going through these. And these are fascinating and gonna just be very interesting for our researchers that were going through what the problems were with that flight when it exploded and what the commission members, specifically Sally, were thinking about how to get NASA back on track. For example, these pages are kind of showing um, uh, the problems with they didn't have enough parts, they didn't have enough time, basically they didn't have enough resources. So a uh, major problem that NASA was having. So that's kind of the things that people would expect us to have. But I also collected, if we can go to her uh, physics, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, she did keep all her physics homework, <laughs> which is like amazing. Now, I can't tell you what this says or means because I'm a historian, but the fact that she kept it and was so interested in it, I think really speaks. So I, I took them all. I took probably a box of her uh, undergraduate work. She had an uh, undergraduate degree in both physics uh, and English. And you can see how that just really, being a physicist was very important to her. Not only did she keep all those, it shows how interested she was in science. And I also collected <coughs> material dealing with what happened. I'm sorry, you can go back to the other one. I wanted to show how it kind of continued on. This is after she left uh, NASA, she went back, she was a professor at University of California at San Diego, and she published over 40 papers, mostly based on her physics resource, uh, research. So she was an incredible physicist. And the other one that you can go to now is her English homework, which I love because the um, professor wrote on this, uh, you're, I hope you're as good as physics as you are in, in, in literature, which you're very fine indeed. Uh, which, and yes, she was. And I think one reason I collected her homework from college is it really shows how she was setting herself up to be an excellent scientist and a great communicator, which is what her English degree brought her. And that's why she was so sought after, I think, on commissions. She was a person of integrity, mm -hmm. uh, but she under could understand the science and she could communicate it with others. And that's what made her so... Uh, very successful at that. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I have to show my favorite picture that I found, which is a mocked is up cute. picture of Sally uh, reading a childhood book <laughs> and somebody had done a thought bubble and those are some of the controls that would have been in her, um, on the space shuttle. And this was actually, I didn't see this the first time around until I got back. This was actually okay. in that first manual I showed you on the first page. So she took that up into space with her to remind her. That so, is a great good. segue. Charming. The picture of Sally with a book yeah. is a great, great segue back to Tam yeah. to let Tam talk for a couple of minutes, if you'd like, about the process of writing your new book, uh, a very personal biography of okay. Sally by the person who knew her best in the world. Okay. Um, would you like Thank to you. share with us a little bit about what is it like to sure. be a biographer? <laughs> Um, you know, is it really, uh, I started, uh, I thought about writing a children's book about Sally for a lot of different reasons, and uh, I started working on it six months after Sally died, and I, it was uh, simultaneously torture to be thinking about her, looking through uh, photographs and so on, but it was also very comforting and a good process for me. Um, and, you know, w what I really cared about was uh, writing a book that told the story, kind of the true story about Sally, who she was, what she was really like, uh, what she cared about, um, and at least some of the very cool things that she accomplished. Um, you know, of course, being the first American woman to fly in space but all the other stuff too, that you know, she was a person, she didn't cash in on her celebrity. She worked, you know, and she, uh, she, she dived into the, the things that interested her and, and worked really hard. And I just, I think that's an important story for uh, boys and girls, uh, you know, across our country to know. And the other thing is that, you, you know, this is a very uh, personal uh, book and, uh, but, but the other thing that I think is so important uh, is that there are very few biographies, uh, especially about American heroes, uh, who are gay uh, or bisexual or whatever the, you know, whatever the right little box is. Um, but uh, so I, I just thought it was important to tell the, the true story. And, and 
You know, young people are very savvy, and young people, uh, you know, even in upper elementary school, are uh, they're smart and um, uh, they see what's going on in the world, and they have opinions and and. Uh, um, and I think young people, maybe even more than uh, us older folks, you know, kind of respect individuality and people's uh, decisions. Um, anyway, I just thought it was an important story to get right and to uh, be honest about. And what I really hope is that, you know, the young people who, who uh, happen to read the book you know, kind of come away and go, wow, what, what, uh, what a fun and full life Sally Ride had. And then the other thing I kind of hope that they come away with is sort of like, you know, hmm, uh, you know, love is love, no matter the gender of the couple. You know, love is the bottom line. So, uh, and I was very fortunate because <laughs> Sally did save uh, so many, uh, you know, I had just this uh, 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 treasure of photographs. And so, you know, I'm lucky, you know, I worked hard on the writing and I actually did the writing first. And then uh, uh, I'd gone through all the photographs, so I kind of knew which ones would fit in uh, the various places. But I wrote the story first and then added the photographs. But the photographs are just amazing, you know, and just help, uh, help tell the story of, uh, of her life. And we have that book here today and immediately after this program, um, Tam will be going to our shop and we'll be signing books there. So if anyone's interested, uh, you can chat with her for a few minutes, uh, talk about the book and uh, have a little one-on-one uh, -on -one time to ask some other questions. But, but before we close out the program, I'd love to hear a few more questions from our yeah. audience. And I see we have a couple lined up. so. Go ahead, please. Um, my name is Nia, and I'm from Whittier. And my question is, um, what is Sally's favorite subject and why? Mm. What was her favorite subject? subject? Do you want to answer sure. that? What, what was, was her favorite what's subject? What's your favorite subject? I like reading. You like reading? Yeah. OK, actually, Sally, Sally loved to read. Um, and so she loved to read all sorts of uh, books. Um, and I think, uh, you know, probably starting in middle school, science was, uh, became, kind of rose on the list and became her favorite subject. And then uh, by the time she got to uh, the end of high school and college, it was really, it, it became physics. Who knows what physics is? No, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's the, law, it's the way the universe works. It's the, the fundamental, uh, Forces and, and, and uh, well, force is probably the way to, way to say it. Forces and particles that uh, determine everything. And she was just fascinated to know that. And she also was a little bit, you know, she liked that physics was hard, you know, so that she could say, I'm a physicist. I learned that hard stuff. I'm pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, let's take an online question. Which is, what was the most surprising thing you learned about Sally Ride doing your research? We did that, that one. I think yeah. we did that we one, did but that. I actually would be, I know what we found when we got to uh, the house to right. work through things. I would be kind of yes. curious to know, for, to you, going yeah. through the process of re-examining all of these things and trying to write the biography, what's the most surprising thing that you learned during your research? That is a hard question. Um, you know, it wasn't a surprise, but it was, a, it was kind of a wonderful reminder. And actually, you know the one minute video uh, of Sally? You see it in there, and it was like, Sally enjoyed her life. She had fun, she was smiling in almost every shot uh, during the video. You know, she was having fun with her uh, teammates. She was having fun being in space. And you kind of imagine a person being uh, very serious or maybe scared <laughs> or all sorts of things. And she was absolutely in the moment having fun. And uh, that was really Sally. So I, you know, looking back and, and talking to her mother and her sister and having them, you know, retell the family stories and the trip to Europe and, and various things, uh, you know, uh, 
Sa Sally had a really good life, and, and the reason she had a good life, she, she was blessed with a, a very solid, stable family, but she was also really blessed with the ability to live in the present moment. When you were with Sally, she was with you. She wasn't distracted, she wasn't looking back, she wasn't looking forward, and she really, she had a, a, a very fun uh, and fulfilling life. So, yeah, it was kind of that reminder that, you know, she had fun. She was a happy kid. She was a happy teenager. She was a happy astronaut. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And apropos of that, when she landed after her first mission, she said, I think that's the most fun I will ever have in my life. <laughs> so, yes, do you have a question? My name is Kasir Pervez, and I'm from Whittier Education Campus. And my question is that how does um, her athletic ability help her to be an astro astronaut? Um, how does her athletic ability help her to be an astronaut? Good question. Good, good question. And uh, <laughs> Margaret addressed that a minute yeah, ago, but you're an athlete too. Maybe yeah. you could comment on some of the characteristics. Uh, you know, I, th I actually think it's two things. It's uh, um, it's the, especially at that time, it's sort of the uniqueness of, of um, it, it makes you stand out to, if you apply for a job or even uh, apply to go to college, if you have something else, you know, that you're on a soccer team or you play volleyball or you play tennis, it, it, it makes you stand out. Okay. And so that helped Sally and that's what Margaret was referring to, to when Sally applied to become an, astro an astronaut in 1977. But the other thing is playing sports and having to work with coaches and teachers and teammates and also being in competition, you know, you don't win all the time. You lose and you've got to learn to cope with that. And oh, that's my yeah. mic, sorry. Um, and so there's lots of really cool lessons you learn from sports or playing a musical instrument or any of the other extracurricular things that you love. They help you with all aspects of life. So, and you know, Sally, as part of our company, this is beyond your question, but thank <laughs> you. I go off. But Sally would, uh, as part of our company, would uh, give talks around the country. And many times parents or teachers would say, you know, I've got this smart kid, boy or girl, and, uh, but, but the trouble is, you know, the trouble with my daughter or son is that they like football or they like, they want to play the clarinet. And Sally would say, so what? Let them do it. They, you don't, to be a scientist or to be anything, mm -hmm. you don't have to just do one thing. Because if you follow the things you enjoy doing, they help, everything kind of reinforces everything else. Sure. Anyway, sorry for a 48 hour long question. <laughs> <laughs> if Thank I you. could comment on the photograph we had with the four girls lined up at the uh, net on the tennis court, uh, the one that is second <laughs> from the left is Tam O'Shaughnessy, mm -hmm. and the one on the right side is Sally Ride. And you were both about 14 then, competing against each other. Yes. And uh, if I recall yeah. the story, you were actually the better player. You played pro for a while. I would say right? that, and Sally can't <laughs> deny it. So, like, she can't change the story. So, yeah. Oh, well, I think this I has think been... I think we might have one last... Oh, okay. okay. I'm Charlotte York from um, Atlanta, Georgia. And my question is, you know, men and women were traditionally kept separate, like in the military, and here she is a woman in space with all these men. <laughs> and I just wonder how that was for her. How did they treat her as a woman? That's my question. Yeah. So, uh, I, mean, I think they treated her as like one of the guys, and she yeah. considered herself one of the guys. Um, she used that phrase, and Margaret can back me up on this, I think. Those first uh, six women that were selected into the astronaut corps did not want any concessions made to them because of their sex. Uh, the only thing they asked for was a separate restroom and shower in the gym uh, at Johnson Space Center, but other than that, uh, you're on a crew, you're all there to accomplish your mission, you all carry the same load, yep. and uh, you're part of a team. And by the time they actually flew in space, they had been sharing an office together for more than a year. They had been on wilderness survival training together. Uh, they were essentially 
a family. Yeah. Uh, it was like, in a way, it was hard work, but it was also like going camping with your best friends. Uh, so she never reported any discomfort. I think she did suggest that they add a privacy curtain to the toilet compartment, which is literally a little closet almost, and it was awkward to close the door. So she suggested a curtain, and they all benefited from that. I think NASA worried a lot before women joined the astronaut corps about how would this work in such a small space. Um, and part of the reason it worked is that those first six women, Sally Ride and the others who were in that class uh, from 1978, were so good at what they did. I mean, yeah. they were just deeply competent. Um, you know, if they uh, were given a task, they learned every part of the task. Um, and that was in a group of 35 new shuttle astronauts who were all deeply, I mean, deeply competent. You don't get that job without working very hard. Um, and so I think mm -hmm. they proved themselves equal to that. And then by the time they went into space, they weren't thinking about, oh, this is the, the one woman. Or this, they were a group okay. with a, a task, and they were all very interested in doing it well. Yeah, I would say that the, I think the astronauts felt that way. I think the public was what, who had the difficulty kind of with that. And you, you get the kind of sense of frustration if you see Sally in any of her interviews when you know, they're asking, you know, do you cry when you get upset? And she's like, I bet you don't ask the guys that question. And, you know, so I think that was very frustrating for her. But within the crew themselves, they were also such competent professionals. I don't think they mm -hmm. saw it at all. I mean, it was just, you know, yeah. a, a group together. So right. yeah. There were folks who had roses for her when she landed. Yes. <laughs> and she did not take them. But there were not roses for the whole crew. <laughs> so she was not interested in being singled out in right. that way, uh, you know some sort yeah. of Miss America moment. Right. And, um, yeah. I think for a person who never sought celebrity, she did gradually learn how to cope with celebrity, but she really lived her life as a private person. And when she needed to be in public, uh, she could adopt that role, but I think it took a toll on her. It, it yeah. exhausted her. Some people are energized by being in the public eye. She needed to retreat from that, and she had a really good sense of how to keep that balance in her life. I would love to keep this conversation going for the rest of the afternoon, but uh, I know that our audiences online and on television and even here probably have some, some other uh, things they want to accomplish this afternoon. And we're going to whisk Tam off to a book signing. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to thank Boeing again for sponsoring this series of programs, What's New in Aerospace. I'd like to thank the students from both schools who came today. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you're here not just because it got you out of class for a couple of hours, uh, but because you really wanted to come to the museum. Um, and I certainly would like to thank our panelists, uh, Patty Williams, archivist, Margaret Wydekamp, curator, Tam O'Shaughnessy, author, educator, and uh, biographer of Sally Ride. You can tell, I think, that we established a relationship over the last couple of years, and you always do establish a relationship with a donor, but sometimes it's a business relationship. Sometimes it's a much more personal one, and, and we all really enjoy each other, and we really enjoyed working together, and we're most appreciative that Tam chose the National Air and Space Museum to be the place to go uh, to find objects and papers from Sally Ride's life. Um, if you have friends and family who might be interested in watching this program, it will be on our website, uh, the National Air and Space Museum's website, starting tomorrow. And if you know anybody watching NASA television at home, uh, NASA will be showing it uh, throughout the day today and tomorrow. So spread the word uh, that uh, you now know what historians and archivists do, and I hope you have a much better understanding of Sally Ride's significance, not just as an astronaut, but as a fully dimensioned human being. Thank you for being here.